Okay. Welcome everybody to the October 2022 edition of Streets for All Happy Hour. We're very excited to have Councilmember Mike Bonin with us. Um, before we get to our conversation with Mike, a few quick updates. Um, a final state 2022 roundup. We're going to talk about Venice Boulevard, um, give our final election endorsements, a few wins and fails, and we'll get to our conversation with Mike. Our icebreaker is which of Mike's accomplishments mean the most to you? Uh, he's been in office for nine years, done a lot, and we're grateful for it. So I'm going to turn it over to Baba to answer that question and give us an update on state. Thanks, Michael. Um, hey, everybody. Hope everyone's doing great. Um, I guess for the icebreaker, you know, it's hard to pick from uh, Council Member Bonin's accomplishments, but I think since it's about the one that knows to me, um, signal priority on the expo line. Um, I that, think that made a huge difference for uh, thousands and thousands of people, including myself, just trying to get to work in school. Um, yeah, and feel free to put yours in the chat also. So I wanted to give uh, everybody an update now that the legislative session is completely wrapped um, on just a quick retrospective on, you know, what we were able to accomplish this year on the state level, because it was a pretty uh, awesome monumental year full of lots of great big wins and some losses too, um, we'll go over those. But the start of the session, we had 10 volunteers. We supported 14 bills that were generated independently of Streets for All. And then we actually, this, one goal this year was to get really involved in the drafting of policy. And we actually wrote five bills and shopped you know, those around with legislators and actually helped craft five pieces, new pieces of legislation that we drove through the legislative uh, process. So if you go to the next si slide, Yay, wahoo, we did it. Four of our sponsor bills were signed and we're super excited about these. Um, they address you know, noise pollution, they address uh, traffic violence. So um, you know, 932 um, requires cities uh, to put in traffic calming measures into the general plan for their deadliest streets. AB 2264 by Assemblymember Bloom um, puts pedestrian head starts whenever a traffic signal on, uh, owned by the state is um, reconfigured or created. <clears throat> AB 2496 requires drivers that have illegally modified super loud mufflers that you commonly see in street racing, requires them to get those fixed. And 1079 begins to investigate um, ways to detect those illegally modified mufflers. Um, so we're really excited about these pieces of legislation. We think they're gonna move the needle um, on creating more equitable and more um, sustainable and safe spaces for everyone. The one bill that we did sponsor that was vetoed, SB 457, which would have created a tax rebate for low-income folks who did not own a car. Um, this, you know, the goal of this was mode shift to get people thinking, hey, if we're subsidizing people for having an electric car, why not give people a reward for having no car at all, which is the most sustainable and, uh, and safe option. So if you go to the next slide, we, uh, we were, however, proud of the amount of conversation this generated. Like, we were kind of blown away, actually, you know, out of all of the things that we worked on this year, um, the, um, just for new pieces of legislation, the amount of buzz that this created was really huge. Um, you know, the Washington Post, New York Times, LAI, LAist, um, Business Insider, and just the amount of people talking about it online was, it was really wonderful. And it, you know, really goes to show you, even if a bill doesn't get passed, Sometimes the conversation it generates can also be just as valuable, and we're hoping to um, to continue the fight to sort of um, to make more financially feasible the options that we actually do want to see in our future um, utilized more. So, six supporting bills um, or six bills that we supported that other um, assembly members and senators uh, wrote um, and introduced were signed into law. So, just a few to to call out: AB twenty eight sixty three creates bicycle parking minimums, the only type of parking minimums we like, and uh, decriminal and AB 2146 by 2147 by Phil Ting, decriminalized walking at non-intersections, which is a huge win. So, you know, now uh, for, for jaywalking laws, if you're not creating an immediate hazard in the street, um, you are not to be cited um, by traffic enforcement or law enforcement. So that is a huge win. Um, we uh, made cycling safer and easier with Laura Friedman's bill, AB 1909, which requires cars to pass you with a full lane and uh, if available and, you know, bans cities from banning e-bikes 
and stops cities from acquiring bike licenses, things that get in the way of people utilizing um, cycling as a means of transportation. And SB 922 by Scott Wiener um, fast tracks bus and bike lane projects through CEQA. And then beyond those great wins, we did have eight of the bills we were supporting died. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but three of them were vetoed by the governor. Um, one that would have forgiven parking fines for unhoused folks. Um, and then another one that would have given free transit to, to all public school students in the state. So we were, we were um, disappointed to see those get vetoed and we're hoping to continue the fight uh, next year for free transit for all public school students. That's a huge one. We do have a legislative report card that we're going to be announcing soon. I wanted to give you guys a preview of it, but it's going to tackle both 21, 2021 and 2022. Right now, the 2021 version is live on our website. If you want to go to streetsforall.org slash report dash card, you can see where all of our senators and assembly members rank in terms of their mobility record for 2021. But the 2021, 2022 version is almost here. Um, finally, I wanted to flag that if you are interested in getting involved on the state team, we would love to have you. Um, just go to streetsforall.org slash get dash involved. I'm gonna put it in the chat after I'm done talking, but we have three main teams, our advocacy team, our communications team, and our analysis team. Um, if you're a policy wonk, you know, get in our analysis team, we need your help. If you like comms, social media, email, we need you in our comms team. And if you really like talking to legislators, making you know uh, comments on a bill at a bill hearing, and just working a bill through the legislative process, we'd love you in our advocacy team. So please reach out uh, at the link that Olga just posted, uh, and we'd love to have you. And I'll toss it over to Katrina to talk about Venice. Thanks, Bubba. I'd have to say that the accomplishment of Councilmember Bono that means the most to me would be the champion, the A Bridge Home program. At the time, I was living in Koreatown in Council District 10, where that program generated a ton of controversy around where it was cited. The result of that was the creation of a mutual aid group, Cape Town for All, and the real elevation of these issues. But it always really stood out to me how much um, Councilmember Bonin really just was so willing to do the right thing and champion these issues when other people were not willing to do the right thing. I'm going to give the group an update on Venice Boulevard for All. Um, here you can get a look at the proposed street reconfigurations that LADOT has put together. And we've been, you know, championing this project and working with them. And this is the first iteration of what we're hoping is going to be a much bigger project with a lot more safety infrastructure um, throughout the whole corridor. And so in this project, in the project savings map, you can see that there's going to be a bus only lane through the eastern section of the corridor and then protected bike lanes through the western section of the corridor, much like the Great Street, which a lot of people have been uh, mentioning in the chat. Just to tell you what's going on right now, we are on track for the Palm section to go in the ground at the end of this year, which is incredibly exciting. This changes the configuration from three general travel lanes, um, a very scary bike lane and parking to a parking protected bike lane and a bus lane and two general travel lanes. We had a lot of amazing supportive survey comments from the community and particularly you all. So I want to thank you all for every single time that you've engaged specifically in Palms, um, in Mar Vista and in Venice, we've got a little bit more of an uphill battle and consequently that more Western section has been delayed to what's being called a phase two of the project. The good news is that it's gonna go all the way to the beach, but we're gonna to continue to need all of your help really working with the neighborhood councils and with LADOT and the rest of the community and the incoming council office on making sure that we can get this project in the ground. I'm gonna turn it over to Olga, who's gonna talk about election stuff. Thank you, thank you. Uh, my number one, Mike Bonin W is gonna be West LA Commons. I think a lot of people don't realize how hard it is to build housing, let alone affordable housing in this state. Um, and that is just one of the most impressive housing projects I've ever seen. Um, so under our final election endorsements, you all probably got our voter guide in your emails. Um, please share it with people who are interested in transit. We worked really hard on it. We've added a few new endorsements on there that people might have not seen. Um, we don't just endorse though, we also support the candidates uh, that we endorse. 
So we have been sending out mailers like the one on the left for Hugo. We've been canvassing for all of our candidates. We have two big canvases coming up. Uh, Kenneth Mejia this weekend, Fatima next weekend. There's gonna be a lot more of that. If you wanna help support any of these efforts, I just dropped our donation link. Uh, we do have a pack, so we are allowed to do things like run social media ads for the candidates that we like. Um, and I just wanted to show everyone a quick 30 second clip of a Hugo ad we made uh, so you can see where your money goes. Meet Mitch O'Farrell, City Council Member, District 13. He's failed to make our streets safer for everyone. He's failed to deal with the crisis at Echo Park Lake. And he's funded by donors who don't even live in LA. No action, no leadership, no vision. No opinion one way or another. It's time to ditch Mitch. Look for your ballot in the mail and vote Hugo Soto Martinez for City Council on November 8th. So yeah, if you want to see more stuff like that, please, please, please donate to our pack so that we can run 80 more ads against Mitch before the election. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Kyle to talk about our wins and L's of the month. <laughs> <coughs> Thanks, Olga. Um, so I think uh, my favorite mic accomplishment has to be the fair free transit. Um, um, just uh, introducing that and seeing it through. Um, that it was estimated to be the largest experiment of its kind in the US. And uh, uh, we see the dividends um, still playing out today where LA has recovered ridership uh, from the pandemic even better than New York has. So just a, a huge win there, so big thanks. Um, and something else we're excited about uh, is the proposed West Side Bike Network uh, where uh, as a part of Mike's West Side Forward initiative and funded by Measure M, LADLT is finally responding to the longstanding petitions of local pedestrians and cyclists and residents on the West Side. And so the project's gonna be built out in four phases, as you can see, uh, Connect Delray Corridor, Ohio Avenue Corridor, Santa Monica to Bayona Creek Corridor, and West LA to Delray Corridor. Um, and so we were just out distributing door hangers this past week to build awareness. And we'll keep, of course, doing whatever we can to see this huge win all the way through. Um, design and construction is gonna run through spring 2023, according to LADLT. Uh, and during that time, they are planning to coordinate closely and co-create with uh, the local community uh, to capture concerns and ideas down to the exact details. Um, and so we saw the start of this yesterday, if you were able to join in uh, uh, the meeting they, they held, the, the workshop, on the first phase, the Connect Delray Corridor. They uh, ran live polls uh, and got uh, instant feedback on key paths and intersections. And But if you missed the meeting, don't fret. Uh, there are gonna be more for the other legs. And at any time, you can still submit feedback, feedback via this really cool online commenting tool, which features the ability to tag a spot and add your own safety and travel pattern concerns to a growing list of others' feedback. Um, it's actually pretty cool. It's a really slick UX, uh, and it's super easy and fun to use. So we can't wait to see your input in real life. Like I said, we'll keep you posted on the big milestones and developments as the entire project is built out over the next couple of years. And now I'll kick it to Adrian uh, for um, the next win. Oh, and check the chat for the link to the um, to the West Side Bike Network uh, comment website, and then within that is the link to the tool. To you, Adrian. Awesome, thank you so much, Kyle. Uh, the, I think the thing that I have appreciated most about Mike's leadership in the past nine years is um, what he, uh, the work that, that Mike did trying to get a vacancy tax in LA. Um, last I checked, it, doesn't, it seems like it's kind of in a, a holding pattern. Uh, City Council keeps kicking it down the road for, for the usual status quo. Um, also appreciate that, that Twitter thread last night as well. Um, so uh, thank you for all of that. We're really going to miss you. Um, so I'm gonna share some information about the transportation demand management updates. Uh, this was a program that was first adopted in 1993, which required commercial buildings to mitigate traffic congestion. This is the first major update in the last 20 years. And it's really important because now we have multiple different modes of transportation to choose from. Um, it'll now include more residential buildings as well. 
and it has a lot more flexibility and uh, is much more in line with uh, the 2035 mobility plan and LA's Green New Deal. This passed the Transportation Commission. It's now gonna go to city council. And thank you to everybody who did a call to, uh, to responded to our call to action and made comment on this important issue. And another win this month is the city of West Hollywood city council voted to extend their micro mobility program. So this is a really great, um, I personally use the dockless mobility in West Hollywood when I'm visiting. So thanks for everybody who called in support <laughs> of this, really excited that this is going to continue. I'm gonna to toss it to uh, Michael to talk about Fiona Creek uh, bike path extension. Thanks, Adrian. Um, my favorite Mike Bonin moment was during COVID. Um, Mike was the first council member to stand up and issue a press release and support Slow Streets. Um, and it's because of him, really, that that project became a reality. So thank you, Mike, for jumping on that and uh, your efforts there. So for our last win slash fail, we're not sure what which this one is yet. Um, Herb Wesson was about to introduce a motion with funding to have the Bureau of Engineering take on the Bionic Creek Bike Path Extension. This is a project we've been working on for two years to extend it to Venice and Cochrane. And uh, Heather came in and we got notification that the project was canceled. And then uh, later we, uh, she expressed a lot of enthusiasm last week at the Pico Neighborhood Council for the project saying she was working on finding funding. So we hope it's the latter. We're really excited about this project. If you live in Council District 10, email cd 10 constituent services at lacity.org just saying you would love to see this happen and um, encourage them to support it um lastly you want to help out streetsforall.org get dash involved please volunteer with us follow us at streets for all on all the major networks we now have kid sizes for our merch and everything you buy is a donation and a quick preview next month we'll have Erin Nigerian, who's a glendale city council member but also the new board chair of la metro and that'll be November 9th at 5 p.m. Mike, welcome. It's, um, it's great to have you. I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight you. I don't think you need much introduction, but just in case, um, Mike was elected to Council District 11 in 2013. He served on the Metro board since 2013. Um, and he's been a champion for so many progressive things around transportation in Los Angeles, including more frequent bus service, bus lanes, bike lanes, signal prioritization for light rail, as well as helping uh, the passage of Measure M. So Mike, uh, we're so happy to have you here. Um, we know it's been a hell of a last couple of weeks to say the least. Um, wanted to give you a space in case you want to say anything. And if not, we're happy to go right into questions, but thank you for being here. Uh, thank you. Uh, wow, it's great to be here. We've had this plan for a while and uh, <laughs> timing is certainly an interesting moment. Uh, love the the icebreaker that you did tonight it was uh, a real heartwarming counterpoint to uh, stuff i've heard on tapes in the past week or so so uh, thank you for that it, it means a lot um as i as i said to the organizers before the call started i just got <clears throat> news a little before we began about uh, kevin de leon's refusal to resign so my brain is a little bit in a in a few different places so I don't have a I don't think I have a ton to say to start out, but I, I do want to say one thing. Um, we're in a a a really powerful moment right now, uh, a moment that's going to be continuing for several months. Uh, how big it is will be determined by what happens over the next three weeks in voting. Uh, and if things unfold the way that that I think and I hope they will, we're going to have an incredible opportunity for significant change over the next few years. This could be a real watershed moment in Los Angeles. That moment was coming prior to last week. That moment now has, I think, additional energy and additional uh, resonance and um, uh, additional necessity as a result of what is sort of a, a, a growing collapse of the old order in Los Angeles as a result of those tapes. Uh, people who have stood in the way of real progress are, are being removed from office 
either as a consequence of those tapes or the, the, the elections that are, that, that are coming up. And it's a, it's a real opportunity to move forward on a lot of the things that we care about, uh, whether it's homelessness, whether it's housing, uh, whether it's, it's government reform, whether it is streets for all, there's a number of things that we can move forward on. And it's, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not at all lamenting that I won't be in city hall for this because I, I still think I will find a way to be a part of it uh, from the outside with you in, in a lot of things uh, and helping to make it happen because there, there's a potential energy that's going to be at City Hall with the new electeds, but it's only going to get real if we keep the energy going at the grassroots, particularly because the energy of everybody who gets elected is going to be uh, dominated and consumed by homelessness. So movement on all the other issues is going to be really dependent upon the grassroots energy, upon the community organizing, and upon the coalition work that we do. Uh, and I think it's all very possible, and I think it's all uh, really exciting, and I'm absolutely here for it, and I know you are, so I'm happy to take as many questions as, as, as time will allow. Thank you, Mike, and needless to say, our heart goes out to you and your family, and you've been in an inspiration in many ways over the last week and a half. I'm going to turn it over to Adrian for our first question. Thanks, Michael. You've been at City Council since 2013, a total of nine years. As you reflect on your two terms in office, what do you regard as your biggest wins? What do you wish you had done differently? And do you think you will ever run for office again? <laughs> uh, well, uh, this is definitely not the week to be asking me that last <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> because it is the furthest thing from my mind right now. Um, uh, you know, the nine and a half years has been a, a wild ride. And I had a first term that was uh, a real lot of fun. And a second term that was just a real pain in the ass uh, at, at almost every moment. I think that it, it's going to take me a while to digest what I think some of the most significant things are that I've done. Um, I, I, I think that in 2015, there was something that I knew this might be the high watermark of my time in office. This might be the most impactful thing uh, I ever get to do. And that's when we approved raising the minimum wage to $15. Um, that was a, a, a huge deal. And I think it will continue to, to, to be one. Uh, it needs to be a hell of a lot higher, but I think that was a, a mark uh, a moment in Los Angeles that sort of knocked some dominoes down and got a movement going across uh, the country. I, I also think, and this is a quiet thing, and I was glad to see that it was mentioned in the chat, uh, I think the the reforming and expanding and strengthening the, the public matching funds program here in Los Angeles has, has had a profound impact already. Uh, I think it has uh, it, it helped uh, give energy to many of the grassroots candidates we're seeing now. You know, Kenneth Mejia and Aaron Darling and, and, and Ugo and, and, and Anissis, they all became much stronger and much more viable because they had those funds there to compete. And I think that's going to be a, a, a real strong uh, lasting thing. The other thing that, that means a, a, a real lot to me is something that is a a partial win, and it was mentioned in, in the chat, and that's Fairless Transit. Uh, we've gotten it uh, for students, but uh, for me, the dream is making it, it, it free for all. Uh, to me, I think Fairless Transit is one of the biggest uh, uh, social justice, economic justice, racial justice uh, things we could do in Los Angeles. It would be absolutely profound, uh, and um, I'm glad we made so much progress on it. I just hope we can we can um, uh, keep going when I'm done. Thank you. Uh, so it's my turn now. Um, wanted to talk one more time about Vista Del Mar. I know we already talked about it last time you were here. Um, just for, for background, in 2015, Naomi Larson was crossing Vista Del Mar. She was hit and killed by a car. In 2017, the city council agreed to a $9.5 million wrongful death settlement, and you ordered changes to the street, um, removing one vehicle traffic lane in each direction, adding crosswalks and bike lanes to calm down traffic. We all know there was a backlash, um, a lot of which uh, people didn't even live in the city of Los Angeles. Ultimately, it was backpedaled and the safety permits were removed. About a year ago, uh, Wendy um, Galdamez Palma was crossing Vista Del Mar with her son when in an effort to save her son, she was killed by a hit and run driver. 
And this will likely result in another multi-million dollar payout. So aside from the hor horrific loss of life, keeping our streets dangerous is expensive and it's a waste of taxpayer dollars. If multiple people getting killed on the same stretch of street and multiple multi-million dollar settlements doesn't cause the city to change, what, what will? You? Um, I, I'm, 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 I'm not kidding. Um, you, um, because the, the landscape of organizing and the landscape of, of um, community energy around safe streets, uh, multimodal streets, is phenomenally, fundamentally different than it was in 2017. Uh, in, in, in 2017, you know, what the hell was that group that John Russo and those folks formed? I mean, they were all over the place. Uh, Keep LA moving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep LA stuck. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they were, you know, hundreds of people at, at every community meeting, uh, dominating, you know, the, the public narrative. Uh, and five years later, the overwhelming public testimony on behalf of the Venice Boulevard project is in favor. Um, there's been real organizing behind it. Uh, the the signature gathering and the momentum behind the, the Streets for All ballot initiative, that was absolutely unimaginable five years ago. That work has also resulted in a different crop of candidates and uh, uh, elected officials. And I think that crop is going to get stronger in the next cycle, not just in Los Angeles, but in other cities, in Culver City, in Santa Monica, West Hollywood. Uh, I think uh, in the parts of town I'm closest to geographically, I'm seeing a lot of that energy. And I think between that combined grassroots energy and a, and a larger group of electeds, perhaps even a majority who are willing to implement those things, I think it's gonna happen a, a lot, a lot easier. Over to Katrina. That is a really good segue into the next question, which is more specifically about Venice Boulevard. So in addition to the Vista Del Mar road reconfiguration in 2017, there was a section that became one of the great streets. We've talked about a little where a lane of vehicle traffic was removed in each direction to make room for some of the city's first parking protected bike lanes. And I really enjoy those personally. But unlike Vista Del Mar, that was made permanent and it's now getting expanded. So we'd like to hear from you. What do you think is unique about Venice that's led to more success than on Vista Del Mar? Why do you think the latest reconfiguration had to be scaled back and is now phased on the Western side? And what do you hope Venice Boulevard ultimately looks like in the future? Uh, let me take the last part of that first. Uh, uh, what I would like to see for Venice Boulevard in the future is uh, protected bike lanes uh, all the way to the ocean and, and uh, bus only lanes as, as, as far as it makes sense. Uh, I would like that for a hell of a lot of major corridors, right? Uh, I'm glad that we're uh, it'll happen after I'm done, but there'll also be uh, additional uh, peak hour, at least, uh, bus, bus lane on uh, Lincoln Boulevard um, uh, near the Santa Monica border. Uh, I want to see that all over the place. And, you know, that's why I supported the, the I support the ballot measure um, uh, and we'll do whatever you need me to do as an ex-elected official to, to help with it when it gets on the ballot. Um, the what was different with Mar Vista is um, I, I think there were different elements to it that people could see, right? They, Vista Del Mar to most people was not a street they intersected with unless they were using it as for cut through purposes, the, the, the vast majority of them, not everybody, but the vast majority. For Mar Vista, for Venice Boulevard, while that is a major cut through street for a lot of people, it's a main street. It's a neighborhood street for a lot of people. And I think that the, the the message and the vision of of making it a small town main street for people in Mar Vista was one that that resonated with people. Uh, you know, you you have lots of parents with kids who still come up to me. They come up to me then, even in the in the, in the heat of all the 
the, the, the controversy and the bullshit, there were people who came up to me and said, oh my God, I feel safe taking my, my, my kid on uh, Venice Boulevard now. And I think that made a, a, a real difference. And people could actually see um, a lot of the, the tangible benefits. And uh, in terms of the phasing of the current project, um, uh, I, I'm not wild about the fact that it's phasing, but I acknowledge the fact that uh, I have a limited amount of time left in which to control events that, that happen there. And the reality is that the only part they could get done while I'm in office is the part uh, east of the Great Street, which, by the way, isn't just Palms. It's also uh, East Mar Vista. It'll be the eastern part of my district for the, the bike lane. Um, and you know the the trade off to the the, the trade off to the phasing is that um, uh, it's become a more ambitious vision. Right now, it's about a bike lane all the way to the beach, and um, uh, I think that actually has an ability to capture the imagination of even more people and get them on and get them on board with it. It's okay. Thank you so much. And hello to everybody in the background of their parents. Zoom. Um, the next question is mine. And I know I mentioned West LA Commons is one of the things I'm most excited about that you did. Um, for those who don't know, West LA Commons is almost like a Park La Brea type of project on the west side that has like a thousand units, almost half of which are affordable housing. And it's just a really impressive thing. So I'm just curious, how did you pull off getting this project made despite all of the restrictions in California against this type of thing? And do you have any advice for future, future council members on how they can build these kinds of projects as well, especially with transit connectivity in mind? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um... You know, it helps when uh, when you own the property. <laughs> I mean, the it's really hard to to build uh, affordable housing or homeless housing on on the west side of Los Angeles. It ain't, it ain't easy to build it anywhere, right? It's particularly hard on the west side where where land is so expensive. So, uh, a principle that that I have used and moved on has been use whatever government property we can, and that reduces the cost by providing the land for free. Uh, this particular area, the, the West LA Civic Center outside my West LA office, is something I have wanted to do since before I was in office. When I worked for Bill Rosendahl, we were actually working on this for a number of years. And back then, people didn't give a shit about housing the way they do now, right? I mean, it wasn't something anybody was particularly uh, excited about in the bureaucracy. That, that, that changed. And my vision for that property was always that it can be an amazing community resource that includes housing and affordable housing, but also a public gathering space because, you know, the, the, the place, I, I, I always say the place looks like it was designed by somebody that Khrushchev was punishing for a, a lack of creativity. And um, uh, that, that can be something for that community. And um, it got more complicated because we don't own all of it, right? The county, the state owned part of it. And then we had to get it from the state courts to the county. And then the county and I had different funding sources. And it was just like, it, it was hurting cats. And if it weren't for the great working relationship between Supervisor Kuhl and I and, and our staffs, I don't think it, 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 it could have happened. It was really, really challenging. Uh, I think it uh, can be improved more. I think they can go a little higher and uh, maybe create some more open space uh, on the ground level. Um, uh, what I would say to anybody else is um, that that's an opportunity. Use government property. I think we can look at using school property uh, to build housing. Uh, there could be housing provided there for teachers so they're not driving two hours a day to and from school. They could actually live close by and you could provide some additional housing as well. Um, I would also say there's another opportunity, I think, in, in my district that I would have moved on uh, had I uh, um, uh, run for and, and won a third term. And that would have been my other office in Westchester at the corner of Lincoln and Manchester. Uh, there's a park there. There's a library there. There's a senior center there. there there's, a, there's a pool there. Uh, there's a huge ball field and a gym there. Uh, and it's it's right on transit lines, and I think it's a a, a perfect opportunity 
uh, uh, to build uh, housing there, and it's 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 right on the corner. It would be it would be great. All right, council member, we have a uh, wonky question for you about the Metro Board, <clears throat> which you've served on for nine years now, and I'm sure you've seen a lot during that time. And over that time, the evidence has continued to mount that you know freeway widening is uh, basically does nothing to mitigate traffic and only creates more catastrophic uh, consequences for traffic, for livability, for housing, for our planet. Um, so it seems as though the Metro Board um, often defers to the Council of Governments, the COGS on freeway widening or in Metro speak capacity improvements. So in your Metro district, um, for example, we spent we spent a billion dollars to widen the 405 and to add a lane in each direction, only for that traffic to get worse in only nine months, uh, and only nine months later um, than before the project started. So uh, Metro, if Metro were to build all 363 planned lane miles of highways in the next 30 years, it, it won't just negate all the greenhouse gas emission savings from rail and bus projects, it will make it a lot worse. So in other words, we're spending all, all this money, tens of billions to make climate change and traffic worse. What does it take for this to change? How are those private political discussions between the COGS and Metro happening? And how do we change the perception of those smaller city heads and managers that often think in terms of level of service, which is you know basically vehicle miles traveled or whatnot? That is a very good question. And this has been a, a continuing arc for me on Metro. You know, the, the 405 project was started before I got elected. I think it was the construction was already underway when I got elected. Um, it finished when I was there. And I, I remember giving an interview early in my time on Metro to a radio station. And I, I talked about, you know, how stupid freeway widenings are and how they're a waste of money. And uh, I got a bit of a, a finger wagging and a lecture from uh, Diane Du Bois, who was then the, the chair of the Metro board in my first year, uh, that I shouldn't be saying things like that. Uh, I think more and more people on the Metro board over time have come around to my way of thinking, but we're a long way from, from that being the thing that, that, that steers and, and, and drives policy. And there's I mean, there's a couple different hurdles, and I, I think you have to appreciate that they're different hurdles so you can strategize about them. I mean, there's some stuff that's sort of locked in because of the way we we, we structured uh, Measure M in order to, to to get it approved, and that's that's harder. And I don't necessarily know what the answer to that one is. In terms of other things where the board has more discretionary authority, part of it is having to organize and and get different perspectives elected to those smaller cities and the councils of government. Those are those are really uh, very important. I, I think we're seeing the, the the birth of a lot of younger progressive leadership in, in, in a lot of cities. I'm obviously not as familiar with 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 other parts of the county as as I am with my own, but uh, you know, I'm seeing some some cool young candidates coming out of Linwood and El Puente and, and, and some other places. So I think that the potential is is certainly there. Um, and then I can't overstate how complicated the politics of Metro are. Um, uh, it's it, it it's sort of like 3D chess. You know, there are things that that, that people have an opinion on. There are things that people care about and there are things that people are passionate about, right? And and for, for most board members, there's that, that, that tier of stuff. And um, you're, you're constantly trying to figure out how much you can push on a bunch of different things without pissing people off so much that, that you lose sight of the biggest thing you're fighting for. Uh, you know, so for me, and a couple of the biggest things I'm fighting for are fareless transit, uh, for preserving the, the bus system, and for reimagining public safety at at, at LA Metro. Um, uh, so that takes up a lot of my time and my energy, or has over the past few years. Uh, and every time I'm fighting really hard on that, I'm pissing off some other members who don't believe in some of those things. Uh, I might not be pissing some of them off, but some of them I am pissing them off. And then that makes it harder to pursue the conversation about the, 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 the freeway expansions, the highway funds and stuff like that. So um, it, it's, uh, it, it, that, that's a tough one. Um, I think a key thing, just to think forward, 
is going to be who the new mayor is and who uh, the new mayor uh, appoints. And uh, the election between uh, uh, Lindsay Horvath and the other guy is uh, an important one to be working on. Over to you, Kyle. Thanks. Uh, so Council Member Bonin, um, we certainly understand the complexity of the politics. And so that also applies uh, at the constituent level, right? So uh, in CD11, it feels like the politics have become more charged and toxic than ever. Uh, debates over everything from transportation to homelessness have gotten incre incredibly heated and personal at times. Why do you think that is? And uh, how do you see us turning that around? Well, I think it, the, it's it's that case for a number of different reasons. Uh, some of them are, are beyond the 11th district and some of them are particular. One, we just have poisonous politics everywhere. I mean, everywhere, at every level. I mean, my social media pages are particularly vitriolic, but you know, uh, uh, my, my my colleagues' pages are are, are are no walk in the park either. Uh, there's just a level of, of vitriol that is really, really strong, and it starts at the the national level, and it starts at at um, sort of what I refer to as the public narrative level, right? I mean, progressive perspectives, whether it's for uh, safe streets, multimodal transit, for homeless housing. Uh, uh, for affordable housing, uh, for fighting climate change, those perspectives don't have the same platform in 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 the in, in the in the channels that 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 influence public opinion. Uh, you know, they've got Fox News, they've got conservative talk radio, they've got NBC Four, Streets of Shame, uh, they've got Nextdoor.com, they've got the West Side Current. We don't have the, the equivalent of that, and that makes it. Uh, really harder to, to shift the dialogue. It makes everything personal. You know, Michael Stubbs, who was mayor of Stockton, was an amazing mayor, uh, led on um, uh, universal basic income. He was a groundbreaking mayor. He got the shit kicked out of him by an online newspaper called uh, the 209 Times. It's the West Side Current in, 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 in Stockton. And they their mission was write shitty stuff about Michael every day, uh, just like the currents is right shitty stuff about this Michael every day. And um, that makes things much more personal. Now, the other thing I, I, I got a cop to, I mean, I'm a, I'm a polarizing figure. Um, you know, I, I didn't necessarily choose to be a polarizing figure. I, I chose to take on controversies and that created some polarization. Um, when you're attacked repeatedly and you reply, then people claim, oh, you're attacking your constituents. So it, it's sort of, you have to defend yourself, but it also feeds the polarization. And um, I think that there's an opportunity to get a fresh start on a lot of stuff we care about with uh, my successor and with a, a, a new mayor. Uh, you know, uh, I'm really hoping that, that, that Aaron wins because I think he comes in um, I mean, the West Side Current's going to come after him, has already started the way they come after me, but he comes in with a fresher perspective and ability to have a conversation with people that I can't have because folks are, are, are done listening, right? And Karen Bass, God willing, comes in and um, uh, you, you, Karen is, 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 Karen has a record as a progressive who doesn't piss people off. It's a talent I wish I, I had. Uh, and um, I think that is a fresh start for uh, a lot of issues. And I think it's just a, it's an opportunity for a clean slate moment you know, with a new council new mayor. Thanks, Mike. Our last question before we go to the audience. So it's on Healthy Streets LA. Um, that was an interesting day. I was with you the day before, trying to figure out if we could get to eight votes. Um, I want to publicly thank you for being one of our six yes votes that we actually had to adopt. Um, instead, we heard Noemi Martinez and others wax poetic about how dangerous our streets are. We failed to implement the mobility plan only to devote vote to delay yet again. Um, and your tweet yesterday, I just want to read it for anyone that missed it. For the past two years, for nearly any piece of progressive legislation, there was usually a less ambitious alternative co-sponsored by Nuri and often Mitch. And for nearly every debate, Nuri, Gill, and Kevin attacked or shit on progressive organizers doing the real work. That's That was your tweet. Um, and my bet is that Nuri's own watered-down initiative is probably dead, given recent events. Um, 
Council seems to love to talk and grandstand and then do nothing. Um, consensus seems overly important. Decisions are often hashed out behind the scenes, making most, most votes premeditated. If you could wave a wand, what reforms would you propose for city council? Would it be charter reform, council expansion, a stronger mayor system? I know we saw a lot of those motions yesterday at council, but wanted to give you a chance to blue sky with us. Well, if I had a magic wand, I'd go back in time and, and make it so that Nuri had never been council president. Um, that would have been my, my, my first magic wand moment. Um, uh, my, my, my second would be, I think the, the things that were proposed yesterday and voted on by council are, are, are all good ones. Uh, I might add instant runoff voting to that. Um, uh, I think that would improve the electoral system and I would further expand the, the matching fund system. Um, uh, and try to get to pull up full public financing. I think that changes the the, the dynamic uh, uh, quite a bit. But I think all of those reforms are good ones. And you know, frankly, they, most of them were unimaginable a couple of weeks ago. I, I, I should say of the tweet that Michael mentioned, uh, it was a it was a long tweet thread, and I'm forever mystified by what catches on on Twitter and what doesn't because this one went like <laughs> insanely. Uh, uh, viral. It was my analysis of the different things that Nuri and Kevin and Gill uh, have roadblocked. And I specifically focused because of COVID recovery, which she chaired, and, and housing and homelessness, which, which Kevin and, and Gill chaired, on renters and homelessness uh, issues and housing issues. Uh, but the same is true of, of, of your issue and, and, and Streets for All. The same is true of a, a number of different issues where you know, if, if, if my name was on it, Nuri wouldn't Go, would, wouldn't let it move. So her name had to be on it. And then you got sort of screwed in the process as, as you did. Uh, and there's, uh, there's a lot of that. I mean, a lot of people were saying, yep, that's what happened to me. That's what happened to me when they, when they saw that thread. And, and what's particularly infuriating about the, 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 the safe streets issue is we knew there was a difference between what Nuri wanted. And I think Nuri had legit issues that she needed addressed about equity, uh, but I didn't think they were incompatible with the ballot proposition. I thought there was a way to sort of circle that square. And Eric Bruins on my staff, who's absolutely phenomenal, you guys know that as well as I do, uh, he was trying to structure a deal with CD6. Hey, we got a couple of weeks before this has to come to council. I know it's a tight timeline, but let's see if we can put this together so that we actually pass something that, that does what the ballot initiative does and also builds in the, the, the equity provisions and the oversight provisions that you want, but they, they weren't having any of it. Um, a little hard to assess if there's an opportunity to, to try to do anything with that uh, before I'm, I'm, I'm gone in 55 days. I guess I'll talk to Eric about that. My, my, my suspicion is that it can be brought back with a, a lot of gusto with uh, the new council. Can we just get a revote on a lot of stuff that Nuri did? That'd be nice. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would, uh, uh, I, I think, I, I, would, I would love to see a lot of revotes on stuff. Um, but you still need eight votes. And when we're down to, you know, 10 or 12, as we are now, it's just as hard to get the eight votes. So uh, the first question um, from the audience, what is the best way to apply pressure on KDL to resign, in your opinion? Well, let's see. I'd say protest outside his house. People have done that. I'd say uh, uh, protest in council chambers. People have done that. Uh, I would say get every elected official in California, including his allies, to call on him to resign. They've done that. I would say get the president of the United States uh, to call on him to resign. I would say get Whoopi Goldberg and the crew on The View to call on him to resign. But we've done all of that. I honestly don't know what else the pope it's good the, the pope and donald trump are the only two left so i'm i'm willing to see which one makes it happen all right <laughs> next question um can you speak about why you voted to confirm paul kirkorian yesterday instead of breaking quorum and refusing to continue city business until we get resignations from daily on the yeah absolutely I'll, I'll take the, the the first part first um uh i i think that Breaking quorum and not holding a meeting uh, would have gained nothing, and it would have caused considerable harm. Um, it, our, our not meeting is zero leverage on Kevin and Gill. 
they don't give a shit what we think and they really don't care what the people of Los Angeles think. Not meeting isn't going to do anything to impact their thinking. But I'll tell you what not meeting will do. It will harm people. Uh, if we did not meet today uh, or did not meet in the next few days, we would not have approved the funding for, for Nithya's item today uh, to convert a project room key into a project home key. And the people living in that project room key, interim housing, would have been evicted on October 31. Uh, if we did not renew the COVID state of emergency uh, by the end of this week, we uh, would have, that would have lapsed. And then renter protections, which are already ending too soon, would have ended even sooner. And given that I saw nothing to, to gain in terms of getting Kevin or Gil to resign, there seemed no reason whatsoever to cause that harm to tenants and to people who would be thrown out on the street. It's just, um, there, there are things we need to do. Um, um, you know, wh whether or not you, you, you have a higher or low opinion of, of the remaining members of the city council, there's <clears> a <throat> work that, that the council needs to do to, to keep people housed and we need to do it. Uh, in terms of uh, Paul Krikorian, I thought Paul Krikorian was um, uh, the, the best choice for, for council president. I've worked closely with Paul for uh, nine and a half years, eight years on the budget committee, nine and a half years on Metro. We have uh, agreed and partnered strongly on a lot of things. We have disagreed strongly and, and fought pretty strongly on a number of other things, particularly in recent years. But Paul is always fair, always thoughtful, um, and uh, is not the kind of guy who, like I detailed in that thread, bottles shit up out of spite or, or, or personal vendetta. And Paul is... Uh, I trust Paul when he says he sees his mission to weaken the power of the council presidency and 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 sort of end the era of autocracy. So um, I think he's a, a a good choice for the next period of time, and there'll be a new crew that comes in in January, and uh, they will choose who they choose. Thanks. Um, there's a lot of ethics reforms being done in a quick flurry after years of nothing or very little. How do we make sure that these very needed changes aren't co-opted by half measures? Oh, uh, th that is a, 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 a damn good fear, right? Because that's sort of been what has happened consistently on everything in the city, right? It's either half measures or it's a pilot program. Um, uh, I think it's going to be working with the, the new progressives on the council. Uh, I think if, if, um, if, if Ugo and Aaron join... Um, um, uh, Aeonissis, uh, you've got a block there that will uh, uh, be working with Nithya and with Marquise and on, on, on and with Katie on certain issues. There's there, there's a there's probably eight votes for something progressive on everything. If you get you know a, a block of four good progressives, you can peel another four different four for different issues. But um, uh, I think that's I I, I think there's greater potential for more far-reaching stuff than 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 we've had before you know legislation is always a a compromise right i didn't get everything i wanted out of the 15 dollars minimum wage thing right um uh but you got a hell of a lot out of it and i think we can uh even when we don't get everything we want i think we can go a lot further than the sort of the the, the half measures and pilots that we've done over the past few years Next question. Homelessness seems to be one of the biggest LA issues that people care about passionately and hinders public opinion on transit due to people perceiving them as unsafe. What have you found to be the best way to show people that progressive policies are better solutions than the status quo policing? Um, well, uh, being able to implement progressive, progressive policies to show people would be a start. Um, uh, we haven't done a lot of that, right? We 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 have not really done a reimagining of public safety in, in in Los Angeles. We've we've talked about it. We've done some studies. We've done some pilots. We have not done anything of any real consequence to to model. If, if people are upset by what they perceive to be uh, as as a crime problem now, what they're upset about is 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 our traditional reliance on cops for everything. Uh, approach because that's what's not working now. We haven't tried the 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 progressive alternatives. 
oddly, we're further along with them at Metro, where we're starting with the, the unarmed uh, ambassadors and, and doing some reimagined public safety there. Um, that's just now starting, so maybe we'll see how that works. We haven't done you know, particularly progressive uh, 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 policy on, on homelessness uh, in Los Angeles ever. I mean, Nithya and I have, have pushed some approaches to, to housing in our district, and Marquis has approached, uh, and MRT had been pushing them. But it's not sort of the, the governing approach of the city of Los Angeles, which still the cornerstone of which is, you know, 4118 and, and ordinances that, that rely on law enforcement. The, the, the best thing we can do to show people that progressive solutions work is get enough votes to actually put progressive solutions in place. Um, and, and we shouldn't buy into the narrative that stuff that's not working now are progressive policies because progressive policies haven't been put in place. And as I detailed in, in that, that, that Twitter thread last night, uh, they've been roadblocked and stymied and, and undercut and, and, and half measured for a long time. There's a question here about mental health that I think is interesting. Um, someone is considering running for the Mar Vista Community Council to Oof. support uh, safety and mobility improvements in the area, but he's worried about his mental health and whether or not neighborhood councils have real influence how do you think neighborhood councils can function effectively? And I'll just add on to it. Um, how do you maintain your mental health while, while dealing with the issues that we all have to deal with in a functioning democracy? Hmm. Wow. Um, <laughs> that, that's actually the toughest question you've asked. Um, uh, it, it's hard for me to advise someone on whether or not to run for, for, for community council. I want everybody to be uh, involved and engaged in making positive change in their communities. My, my advice on whether or not to engage at the community council level is watch the community council, go to a few of them, and even if you can imagine the, the voices on the council changing and the, and the governing perspective changing, ask yourself, is, is that, does that suit your talents and your skill sets most? Is that your best way to make change? And for many people, it is. And for many people, it's not. A lot of people have joined them and said, that's a waste of my time. I can actually get shit done in the community without you know, dealing with parliamentary procedure and Robert's rules of orders and, 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 and fights over all this kind of stuff. Uh, in terms of mental health, man, you know, um, for a while, I found public service and, and taking care of my mental health to be very compatible. And then for a long time, I did not. And for me, uh, the best way to take care of my mental health is to, is to step away from this work. And not step away from from public service broadly written or community activism, but step away from being in elective office. Um, it's uh, uh, it's been insane, and just making my decision last January has improved my mental health. Uh, and the past week has certainly done nothing at all to make me question my decision. Um, for me, uh, mental health means. Uh, hiking and mental health means playing with my son. Uh, for everybody else, it's, it's something different. Those are two things that restore me physically, mentally, spiritually. And um, in addition, whatever you may do for talk therapy, whatever you may do for medicine, meditation, and whatever else you find that, that feeds your soul is the way to go. Any last words you like to say? I know we're at time. Um, no, I think I, I think I said my last words at the beginning, and so I'll end in the same way, is we're at a moment of uh, in, in incredible change in Los Angeles, and uh, the biggest way to make sure it happens is you. And um, so please uh, get the right candidates elected over the next three weeks, and then uh, keep on them in good ways and in bad, and find effective inside-outside strategies, and, and let's get stuff done. And thank you very much for the, the kind words tonight and for the, the love and the friendship. I'm very grateful. Um, well, thank you, Mike. Uh, you've been an inspiration to us for, for years and you fought the hard fights even when they're not easy. So we just want to say on behalf of our community and our steering committee, thank you so much. Thank you for being here on what has been an unbelievably trying week and a half, I can only imagine. And um, honestly, we, we're looking forward to the next, uh, what is it, uh, month, month and change. Uh, view in office and then can't wait to see what you do next and we'll yeah, be me either. <laughs> thanks thank you good night everybody All right.